subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell icon to get the latest updates. Let me start Global Print this week by telling you a story, dear viewer. And this pertains to 20 long years ago when the Americans came to Afghanistan and threw them out. And soon after, NATO troops were brought in to restore peace and stability on the ground. Now, as part of those troops was a Canadian commander who evidently told a Taliban leader that he met, why don't you lay down your arms, come over ground, become a member of Afghan society. And he evidently gives this Taliban leader a deadline to come over ground. But in answer, the Taliban leader says to the commander, you may have the watches, but we have the time. Now, 20 years later, on the 31st of August 2021, the last U.S. serviceman have, has left Afghanistan. Another chapter in Afghanistan's long history of invaders, conquerors, dynasties, has empires has come to an end with the U.S. empire having bitten the dust and gone back. From 1979 to 1989, of course, we know that the Soviet Union bit the dust and was sent home. The Afghans this time are being led by the Taliban who have taken Kabul on the 15th of August and are now the new rulers of Naya Afghanistan. So what does this mean for the world? What indeed does it mean for India? But before I answer all those questions, dear viewer, I'd like to make an appeal to you. Please do consider subscribing and paying just a little bit for the print's free, fair, objective and unhyphenated journalism. It's only 159 rupees, but you get an array of benefits as a subscriber. There are links uh, to subscribe in the description of this video, both for an international audience as well as for a domestic one. So do click on the join button and subscribe and help us bring you the best news stories and videos as we have been doing these last several months. Now back to my column Global Print this week in which I talk about what else? But Afghanistan, it's been on my mind and of course it's been on your mind. The Taliban's deadline to, to the U.S. to send back all its troops is being observed. Some American civilians, uh, citizens are still there, as are um, civilians from other Western countries. A handful of Indian nationals also remain. Over a hundred or so Afghan Sikhs still remain, but uh, India is not very sure about what they want to do, whether they want to come to India or whether they want to go to the U.S. or Canada. At any rate, some were brought back last week when an interagency team uh, was sent back to Kabul from New Delhi, both consular officers as well as uh, people from the intelligence services. And over a hundred Indians as well as Afghan Sikhs were brought back. And you saw the pictures of the petroleum minister, Mr. Hardeep Singh Puri, who is a Sikh himself, carrying the holy, uh, the book, the, the scripture, the sarupar on his head. And uh, this was a very moving moment, of course, but these were brought back from, um, from Kabul on that special uh, Indian Air Force flight. Now, over the weekend, interestingly, a very interesting development has taken place. The leader of the Taliban's political office in Doha in Qatar, Sher Mohammad Abbas Tanikzai, has sent a message to India. This came as part of a 46-minute long speech in Pashto that he made uh, which was put out on all the Taliban channels and social media channels. And actually, what is quite interesting is that the Taliban is really good at promoting its messages on social media, whether it's on Twitter, Facebook, and uh, various other TV channels. And each of these spokespeople have Twitter handles, so you can follow them too. Um, so Mr. Stanikzai put out this message in which he said things like, we want much better relations with India. Uh, these have gone back. The ties with India have uh, have gone back over several decades, if not centuries. And he talked about improving trade. He talked about a road transit. So here is the first of several questions that I'm asking on Global Print this week as a new chapter unfolds in the great game in Afghanistan. Now, this cliche, the great game is, of course, a very old one, more than a hundred years years old when the then British Empire in Afghanistan fought the then Tsarist Empire in Russia and and this game between those two old empires was called the great game that became a cliche but over the last hundred years or so we see how this cliche is 
so symbolic of what has been happening in Afghanistan. So another chapter of this old great game has now opened again with Stanik Zai's message to India. Now, the question that I'm asking is, first of all, can India trust this message by the Taliban leader, Sheikh Mohammed Abbas Stanik Zai? The second question that I have, it is clear that in Kabul, amongst the several factions that hold sway, it is an anti-India Haqqani network that has control over Kabul city. Now, we know that the Haqqani network is particularly an anti-India uh, terrorist organization. It has at least three attacks over the last 20 years have been sourced to the Haqqani network, two against the Indian embassy in 2008 as well as in 2009. In fact, an Indian diplomat as well as India's defense attache was killed in one of those attacks. And in a third attack around 2012, several Indian army officers who were uh, staying in a guest house in Kabul, they had been there. They were not army officers in the sense that they were training Afghans, but they were teaching them English. They were bombed in a, in a midnight attack or in an early morning attack and all of them, or most of them were killed. So the Haqqani network, uh, it, was, it was believed at the time that the Haqqani network was responsible for all those three of the attacks. So on the one hand, Mr. Stanik Zai is sending a message to India saying nice things about India. But on the other hand, the Haqqani network, which holds sway or controls Kabul, which is a well-known anti-India organization, how far under the circumstances should India trust the Stanik Zai message? So the third question that several people are asking is, has India lost this round? Has Pakistan won this round in this battle for influence for Afghanistan? Not just Afghanistan, but in, indeed across the region, has Pakistan won this round? And we see how China and Russia and China and Pakistan, of course, are very close, close buddies and allies, how both these countries have their embassies open in Afghanistan as well as with Pakistan, of course. India has had to retreat but as I just told you, an interagency team was sent back and now Stanik Zai's message. So has India lost and Pakistan won this round? The fourth question, have the Americans lost this round and have their Beth Noir, the Chinese and the Russians, have they won this battle for influence of international uh, reputation? Have they won this round? And the last question is, how is India going to deal with the unfolding situation in Afghanistan? So let's take these questions one by one and let's try and answer it. The first two questions on Stanik Zai's message, um, and let me tell you here, perhaps you know already, you may have read my colleague Simran Saru's profile of Stanik Zai in the print, otherwise you must take a look at it, dear viewer. Now, in the 1980s, a young Sher Mohammed Abbas Stanik Zai was a cadet at the Indian Military Army in Dehradun. Now, isn't that interesting? So he was part of a group of uh, Afghan cadets who had been invited by the Indian government. And the Indian government, you may know, invites people from all over the world. They come and train in India. They come and live in India for about a year. And then they go back as ambassadors, not just of their country, but also friends that they have made in our country. So Mr. Sanik Zai is actually a graduate. He passed out of the Indian Military Academy in Dehradun. Now, why was Stanik Zai picked to send this message in Pashto in which he said nice things about India? Was it because he graduated from the IMA and therefore knows India better than the other Taliban leaders? That's one thought. The other is that a few years ago, uh, according to one of my sources, there was this track two conference between Indian, Afghan and Pakistani participants. And Mr. Stanik Zai was also um, a participant in that conference. And uh, according to somebody who shall, of course, remain unnamed, Mr. Stanik Zai wanted to meet one of the Indian participants in that track two conference. Now, there were Pakistanis also around. So he, he eventually did catch up with the Indian participant who shall remain unnamed. And one of the reasons that it took him, um, you know, more than a couple of days to meet this Indian person um, late in the evening completely off the record in his room was because he said that he was trying to give the slip to his ISI minder. Now, the ISI, of course, is Pakistan's intelligence agency. So you would wonder, is Mr. Stanik Zai actually, was he actually interested in giving the ISI minder the slip? Or was it that 
that there is a double game still being played somewhere. Now, this story of Stanikzai reminds me of the story of Mullah Baradar, who is the other top leader of the Taliban. He's back in Kabul, as you know. Uh, there are talks between him and several other Taliban leaders, as well as with former President Hamid Karzai, as well as uh, Afghan's other key leader, Dr. Abdullah Abdullah, the only two in the former governments who have stayed back in Kabul. Now, Mullah Baradar, as you can imagine, is a very important figure. He was the interlocutor with Zalmay Khalilzad, who was the U.S. envoy for Afghanistan. So the story of Stanik Zai, of him trying to escape his ISI mind within quotes, reminded me of the Mullah Baradar story. Now, what happened was that in 2010, Mullah Baradar was picked up by the Pakistani military establishment in Pakistan. And as you know, that uh, Afghans go in and out. Mullah Baradar was also the co-founder of the Taliban along with Mullah Omar um, in the early 1990s. So um, Mr. Baradar was picked up by the Pakistani agencies and thrown into jail. So he was in jail from 2010 to 2013 and subsequently he was brought out and he was put into a guest house. And according to my information, and I can tell you that my information is um, spot on, at least in this respect, he was, that guest house was actually an ISI safe house. So why did the Pakistani intelligence put him in, in its own safe house? Was it because they wanted to control Mr. Baradar? Was it that Mr. Baradar was one of them and that they wanted him to, they wanted to send him back into Afghanistan as one of their own people? Now, that story remains unclear. So anyway, to uh, cut this long story short, um, from 2013 to 2019, he remained in this safe house six long years. And in 2019, the Americans put pressure on the Pakistanis to release him so that he could be brought to the negotiating table with Zalmi Khalilzad, the U.S. special envoy, so that the U.S. and the Taliban could cut a deal for the Americans to exit safely and and perhaps for the Taliban to uh, return to Kabul as the new players. We know how some of that has unfolded, but that story of Mullah Baradar remains uh, not fully explained even till today. So the question is, are Mullah Baradar and Mr. Stanik Zai, are they handmaidens of the ISI or are they independent leaders? They may have been used and they have definitely used the ISI to bring them to power but now they will be independent minded leaders who want to assert themselves in the new th in the new Afghanistan that they want to create. So it's still not very clear uh, in, you know, reading the tea leaves at this point is not going to help very much. So it's so perhaps India should watch and wait and see how things unfold over the next few weeks. Now, to answer the question, has Pakistan won this round? Has India lost on the face of it? Yes. Pakistan has definitely won this round. Pakistan's military establishment, its spy agency, the ISI, has demonstrated patience over 20 long years. And now they have come back. They have put their men on the ground. We saw how Pakistani fighters fought alongside the Taliban to take city after city, province after province, until they reached the outskirts of Kabul. And then Kabul fell. And that story we, have, we already know. So the Pakistanis, yes, primary player in Afghanistan today, just like in 1996. In 1996, Pakistan was just one of three countries that had recognized the Taliban at the time, along with Saudi Arabia and the UAE. But what is interesting today is that no country, including Pakistan, has still recognized the Taliban. So let's look at a map of Afghanistan. You have the Chinese and the Russians uh, neighbors still with their embassies on the ground. You have the Pakistanis also with their embassies. The Iranian embassy uh, has reopened. The Iranian ambassador has returned on the weekend. So Afghanistan's neighbors are all willing, at least behind the parda, willing to recognize the Taliban. I think they know that it's inevitable. So what should India do? Now, some stray signals were available at the UN Security Council in New York on the other end of the world from Afghanistan this month as India, in its capacity as president of the council, ensured that several discussions on Afghanistan were held. A lot of the countries, not just the P5, the permanent five, 
but other countries also put forward their views on what uh, the bottom line should be in Afghanistan. So we have seen at the Security Council a statement in which the reference to uh, Taliban as a terror organization was dropped. Now, this is clearly a signal, a message, an outreach to the new Taliban. It shows that India as president of the Security Council, no matter that it was a non-permanent uh, member which, uh, who was a president, but it was very much on board that discussion and the reference to the Taliban as a terror organization was dropped and India went, went along with that. Now, in a couple of weeks, the accreditation committee of the UN is also going to meet where the Taliban's representatives will ask to be accredited to the United Nations. That is going to be a serious exercise. India is not a member of that committee. Some diplomats say, thank God, because we don't want to be. But on the ground, the message is that India is willing to consider playing ball and, to, and is willing to come to terms with the Naya Afghanistan. I think India's new pragmatism is a very interesting development. On the one hand, you can argue that India had no options but to be pragmatic. But that is an unkind, that would be an unkind cut, I would say. I think India has swallowed a lot of uh, the spit that was generated these last several weeks, a lot of sort of heartburn uh, on how, what happened in Kabul, how did the Afghan army collapse so quickly? Why did Ashraf Ghani, that India supported determinedly over the last several years, why did he flee? That heartburn, I think, is coming to an end and India is coming to terms with the reality on the ground in Afghanistan. And if you watch an interview that I did with Dimitri Trenin, one of Russia's best known political observers, and Yun Sun, a Chinese political observer, I will tell you one last thing, which is, that as, Mr. as Dr. Trenin said to me, he said Russia plays uh, the international real politic game differently. We don't look at what we want to do, what our desires are, but how things are on the ground. And perhaps India, who negotiated its torturous way through the Cold War years, is now relearning that lesson again, which is that it must learn to play with all the players however much it may like them or not like them. So today the Taliban are in power in Kabul and India is, is at least for the moment, at least it's being seen to be willing to look at all the options on the ground. Um, I will end by telling you that Prime Minister Narendra Modi and the Russian President Vladimir Putin had a conversation last week. They spoke for 45 long minutes. We don't know exactly what they spoke about, but... I can bet my last rupee that a large part of that conversation was about Afghanistan. So that story will continue, dear viewer. Do read my column in the Global Print and let me know what you think about this video. Thank you so much for watching.